Hello, it's Phil from One Wall Studio here to do another mix fix. This time it's for a track called God of the Impossible by Isaiah Jurgensen. All right, so first off, let's show you guys the difference between mine and his so that you can get a feel for what's different between the two. When his mix comes up, it drops significantly in perceived loudness. It doesn't feel as upfront, and it feels a little bit weaker. Specifically, you can usually hear it how the guitars don't come forward as an element like they do in my mix. But the drums are a lot louder. So I'm going to show you how I achieved that. To start with, I'm going to turn off all of my mastering effects. Now, check this out. I'm going to turn off all effects, period, and A-B the mix that way. Now, how did I get everything to come forward like that? You may be asking, and if you're not, you probably should be. Let's start here at the drums. First off, this is very clearly using a drum machine of some kind, or a drum sampler, because the overheads... You only hear the overhead version of cymbals. You don't hear any of the shell pieces inside them. Now, what I did with the EQ for these is I cut a little bit of this high-range energy from it at like 6.7k where there would be other stuff that that high end would be conflicting with and I primarily left the stuff above 10k alone I also high passed a little bit just so that there was a focus that that I wanted to get rid of was basically competing with the guitars and some of the high end on the drums. So I just cut that to make space for those things. Up next was the kick. And there were a lot of different kick tracks here. Mostly what I wanted to do was bring up that high end to compare it to the reference track and cut a lot of this 200 Hertz right here so that there was room for the snare and the bass guitar. I also boosted the low end a little bit with a shelf so that there was some rumble in that low end. Up next, I used multi-transient and I increased the attack of every single band just a little bit, which I basically could have done the same thing by using the master band and just turning it up like 25%, but I adjusted the sustains individually different. So I cut the bass sustain so that there's not too much length on the boat bass. The low mids, I cut a little bit of the sustain so that you really just get the attack from that band and it doesn't ring out too much like this. You really hear that body pull back a little bit so that you get just the punch from it and not too much of the ring. And then I boosted the high end on those high-end sustain and the treble sustain. So let's A-B that. It just makes it a little bit punchier. Lastly, I threw a clipper on it just so that it would act as a limiter on the top end, but clipping it brings forward the body a little bit. Also gives it more of a saturated feel, which I like. For the snare, it was a blend of a whole bunch of different snares as well. So first I EQ'd it to bring up a little bit of this 5K area where I felt like it really smacked. I also brought up some 400 hertz and some 200 hertz. because otherwise it just felt too clicky.
After that, I use the transient designer to boost the attack a whole lot and boost the sustain on the low end a lot. So that rang out in the low end a little bit more like a real snare to me. So you hear how it really punches and then it pulls back a little bit in everything but the low end. That's kind of the effect I was going for with this snare. Because then when I use the clipper, it really brings out that body overall without the sustain stepping all over things. I really wanted that sustain because there was no room track provided and there's no snare in the overheads. So what I'm essentially doing here is kind of emulating the sound of a snare in the overheads with that tail that kind of fades out after the initial smack from both the overhead and the snare mic. So that was kind of like a, I don't have a overhead or room track for that. So I'm going to blend in a little bit of reverb over here in this send, which is basically just a default Valhalla plate and then EQ that out so that there's not a ton of the 400 hertz that I boosted and not a lot of the 4K that was right around the area that I boosted. And that just subtly colors the reverb. Makes it a little less boomy and a little bit more space inviting. All right, so on to the next part is the toms. This, I only use multi-transient. Boosted the attacks a lot, cut some of the sustains in the low end so that it doesn't poofily ring out, but that the high end sustains a lot, and boosted the attack quite a bit. Up next, I used a clipper to bring out the body and saturate it a little bit. There's also a spot mic for every single symbol. Which I didn't even bother to pan because they were pre-panned already. Pretty much everything here I left with its default panning. And for this I used a high pass. I cut that low end at like 200 hertz ish so that if anything had content down there, it would be brought down to not conflict with the uh, snare or the toms or the kick or any of that stuff. And then I brought down 8.5k so that I could sufficiently prevent it from stepping over the high end of, again, like the guitars and the kit pieces and vocals, all that stuff. So this really just focuses in on the mid-range of the cymbals, which makes it feel a little bit more like they're in a room. You hear how that really opens up the individual kit pieces when I do that, because then the the shiny 8K area isn't focusing on the cymbals as much. It's focusing on the click of the kick and the snare. But they're still just as audible in the mix, so it creates more of a roomy feeling cymbal than a super bright shiny cymbal that conflicts with everything else. So then from there, look at the drum bus right here. I'm using Magnetite by Black Rooster, which you could use pretty much anything that has any tape emulation. And I have it set to really clip that input of the tape. You notice how it creates that smeared tape punch sound, and I really wanted that for this. Up next, I have this bus compressor doing just a little bit. Super slow attack and release and fast release with the side chain on 60 so it's not really pumping when the low end hits. It's just clamping down on the top end ever so slightly, never really doing more than one or two dB. And then I have this limiter, finality, never doing more than like one dB as well. Even during the hardest parts, it never really goes beyond two. So we're really just bringing out everything with limiting on the drum bus, taming those transients a little bit 
I do also have a parallel compression bus that's being sent from the toms, the snare, and the kick. I have it going through Noise Ash Audio's Need console, which is a uh, Neve emulation, and I have it pushing up from a high shelf at 16 kilohertz by about 3 dB. I do have it driving the input a little bit with the input drive on of the preamp. I do have a low shelf at 18K just to focus it so that the top end doesn't go too wild. So then you, I also have a high pass at about 45, but I'm pushing up on all the fundamentals by about 3 dB on a shelf in the low end. I'm cutting some 400 hertz and I'm cutting some 700 hertz, mostly all by two or three dB increments. Without that EQ, it sounds like this. So I'm just bringing out the top and the bottom a little bit since it's in parallel. And then I'm clipping it really hard, acting as a ceiling so as to keep it consistent. This just helps it feel more consistent dynamically. And it's only blent in a little bit, but you can really hear it when it's not there. It just opens up the top end a lot. So I have the bass guitar. I'm using three plugins, Audio Assault's Duality Bass Studio. I'm using Re-EQ. And I'm using Preamped, which this is the last thing in the chain. So basically, I'm running it through an amp, which has a drive knob in Pre, so this is acting as like a pedal. For the most part, just high passed up to 100 hertz for the drive and mixed in at about 35%, and the rest of it's just the crunch of it. So you hear how it changes it ever so slightly, but you still have the real bass tone. Then I have the amp cranked in terms of gain, turned down the bass a little bit because it was actually a very bassy DI, as you can see here. Turned up the mids and cranked up the treble and presence, gave it a little bit of a crunch and mixed in it again about 35%. So this signal is like 35% crunch and sub, 35% drive, and 35% natural bass tone. And then I have it run into a cab, just a 421 on the Ampeg. Then I have cutting the 62 hertz right here on the graphic EQ so that there's room for the kick. I have a little bit of cut at 500 hertz and boosts from 1K to 2K. Cut a little bit of 4K so it doesn't get in the way of guitars and vocals. And that's about it. Then I also have a comp on it. Now, without the amp sim, it sounds like this. Hence why I use the amp sim. Without this 200-ish hertz cut, it kind of stepped over the low end of the snare. So I wanted to get rid of that in both the kick and the bass so that the snare really had room to breathe. I know it sounds like it carves out the bass a lot, and that's because it does, but that carving helps out a lot when it comes to having room for the snare. So lastly, I had preamped, which is basically driving this into a modern style preamp. I'm cutting 440 hertz a lot. I'm boosting like 3.2K so that when the kick and the bass both hit, they hit with the same kind of snap or the same kind of mid-range, high mid-range punch together so that they actually do kind of work off each other. so that they have a unified click. And then from there, I'm just setting a clipper at the very end of the chain to clip it into the preamp whenever it passes negative one dB. This gives it a much more dynamic consistency. So it's still a very dynamic bass, it's just clipping on the top end. So your guitars were a totally different thing. 
if you notice. Initially, there was a huge hole here and not a lot of low end. It was actually mostly just a 4K peak. So the first thing I did was I cut a lot of 4K, boosted a lot of 400 hertz, high passed it a little bit so that the low end didn't get hairy, cut some 768 hertz, which is like around the 800 hertz area, and then low passed it to about 7K, but with a little bit of a resonance shelf so that stuff in like the 5 to 6K region gets boosted. You really don't need that fluffy bottom end because that's what the bass guitar is doing. It's supporting the guitar with that. So now your guitars can come forward a lot in the mid range where their actual notes are hitting. And cutting some of that 4K, boosting some of that top end makes them sound a lot more well rounded, a lot more, well, tight. Because otherwise, it's just that one resident peak and the occasional really low end on the chugs which conflicts with the bass. So now it can be filled out in a way that works for both of them. Up next, I used Magnetite again to really push that uh, input into the reds on the tape. Which has the added effect of doing tape compression. and it filters it just enough that it focuses it more. Then with preamped, I brought up the overall level a lot, had it clipping into another tape, with tape R is the preamp I chose. I'm driving it hard. I'm boosting more of that 340 hertz area. Also boosting above where the snare is at on the low end. So it's boosting at like 268 hertz. So just getting that low range extension, so to speak. Then I'm cutting 4K again by a lot. And I'm driving it into the clipper of this tape. So that's like two layers of tape <laughs> getting clipped. But now you notice it's just got that little bump down here for vocals to sit in. And the focus is now more in the 2.5K area so that you still get that aggressive tone, but it's not peaking in like the 4K area, preventing anything else from being heard up here where the, the drums are all gonna be punching. And it's got this nice, fat, low mid-range. So it's less squealy, but it fits really well with everything else. Up next, I have the layers of screams. Very simple work here I did. I boosted some lows, cut some mids because they're just the layers behind the screams. Boosted some high mids, boosted a little bit of that higher area. Cut some of that 8K so that it doesn't step over the brightness of the main vocals. And I boosted some air above it. It gives it more of a behind the main vocal feel while still being bright enough to understand. I also used this compressor, the 76, just because, you know, everybody uses it. Totally crushed, but that's okay because the backgrounds. Saturated the heck out of them. So it brings them more to the forefront. Again, with tape. I, I'm a tape head. Huh, get it? Tape head. All right. And I use this de-esser to prevent it from stepping over the main vocals when they're doing a thing that's kind of more bright or aggressive. So it really just brings it down by a couple dB. Now I did a lot more to the harsh vocals, and here's why. 
First of all, there was a lot of EQing that had to be done. So let's start at the beginning. First thing I did was I cut a lot of this high end because there was just way too much resonance. And so I boosted some of that 400 hertz. Because otherwise it sounds too airy, almost too whispery. So I cut those resonances so that the main peak could come out. I also put this dynamic EQ on it so that I could boost some of the air while controlling it and also control the uh, inconsistency of the dynamics of that main area of between 500 hertz and 1k. It really helps control the vocal a lot more. So does the 76, which brings up the overall volume a lot and controls the dynamics a lot more. I saturated it. This time, not with tape. This reintroduces harmonics that I kind of cut out earlier. After that, I use this de-esser because the S's are harsh. And make it far more consistent, far more controllable, with much less harsh S's because the S's will get unwieldy. Especially if we were to brighten things up in mastering, which I know that you like brighter mixes, that's part of a problem. So. If you notice here, I also have a compressor that's side-chained to the clean vocals, so that when the clean vocals play, it ducks the aggressive ones. That solves the problem of things getting out of hand during the chorus. So with all those layered main vocals, some of them have to step back a little bit, otherwise you have way too much vocal. But you wanted the cleans to be as clear as possible, and you wanted to have a focus on both. So, what I did was, I made sure that it only ever cut like 3 to 4 dB at max. Because otherwise, it'll do this. Which isn't bad until you realize that makes the vocals stick out of the mix a whole lot. And I only want it to duck when the chorus is happening. This brings the cleans up front a little bit for the only section that they're in and pushes the harsh vocals back just a little bit to help out with managing overall levels and the dynamics of the song. So speaking of the clean vocals, for the clean vocals, I cut everything below 230 hertz and I took a huge chunk out of 666 hertz. Ooh. I serve the God of the impossible and boosted a lot of 2.5k and 6k now you notice how that makes there more peaks but it's overall flatter because the original recording had a lot of this and not a lot up here so I don't know what kind of mic you used, but it seems to be very not bright. After that, I used TDR Nova to control that note again and boost the high end to further create a flat response up in the top end. For the vocal and the chorus, I actually used a chorus. He can't do anything improbable. To make it sound more like you double tracked it to really thicken up that main vocal, I used 1176 again to boost the overall volume level and control the dynamics. Of the God of the Give it a little bit more aggression too with a fast attack, fast release. He can't do anything improbable. I serve the Christ to it needed DSing after that. The one who has given everything, he gave it all. So there's still some attack, but you he cut down on the S's. And this time I saturated it using tape, but just a little bit. Just 2 dB of input gain. 
He can't do anything improbable. Now you may think it sounds fluffy. Of the Christ. We're a little bit too aggressive, but in the context of the mix. So you notice how it helps your vocal come forward just a little bit and be heard over the rest of the mix, which, while not really dense, is harmonically dense. So it just needed that little boost up to make it stand out. And because the compression is sidechained, the harsh vocals come right back up immediately after the chorus is done, which is Pretty much why sidechain compression is so cool is because it works that way. First, I had a clean reverb. A very lush reverb. A cavernous one from Podform. Which helps out with the uh, depth and focus of the vocal. And I EQ'd it just a little bit by high passing it, cutting some of the higher mids where the main note would have become unwieldy or the main area where your voice sits would have become unwieldy. I cut some of this higher energy area so that it didn't get in the way of like, you know, guitars and stuff. And then I boosted the air right above 6K. Because you don't want it to sound too full because then it'll step all over the vocals. So I do cut out those little parts that would have it conflicted with the vocals. Same with the delay. Because if you hear too much of the voice in the delay, then it's going to step over the voice. <laughs> it's basically just a ping pong delay set to a quarter note and set with the feedback at like 30%. Keep in mind, all this is being done in parallel, so it's focused between 250 hertz, 7K, so that it really focuses the sound. It almost feels louder when you do that because then you've got more focus on the mid-range area, which will help it sound like the vocal became very wide and deep with the verb and the delay. I serve the God of the impossible. He can't do anything improbable. I serve the Christ who is king. It gives it some crazy depth without becoming too loud or unwieldy in the actual mix itself. I also have what's called an automated delay, which only comes up uh, in these areas where I automated it on the harsh vocal track. <laughs> Because I'm a sucker for the metalcore bleh with the delay on it. The fun thing about this automated delay was I just used this free plugin. Have it set to really low quality, very high pass, very low pass, and 100% effect, quarter note, tape, boom. You've got a disgusting sounding delay that fits. And it just fills those gaps between the pre-chorus and the chorus, for example, that really helps things to flow when there's no vocal. The other thing I have is what's called the filth delay, which is mostly for the harsh vocal. It's also a ping pong, but it's a faster ping pong. Same settings for the most part. But then I cut a lot of the high end. Listen to how it sounds without that. Cut a lot of that main area of your vocal with the 750 hertz. Cut a lot of 3K and ton of 8K and I have a high shelf cutting at like 13K because I really don't want the S's to be so aggressive in the delay because then, you know, you don't get the body. You get just a whole bunch of all over the place. And controlling S's is pretty important to me. 
So that's a vocal delay just for the harsh boys so that it uh, helps fill out the harsh vocals when they're alone. It just kind of gives you the illusion that there's more of you than just the one, which is kind of the point when you have a very dense mix like that. Lastly, I did some mix bus work, but not a ton, and you'll see what I mean. The reference mix that I used was Angry Letters to God by Impending Doom, and I won't play that because I'll get copyright striked. But you'll notice my mastering choices came out to reflect that a lot. First, I used a mix bus compressor, the API 2500, because I like how it feels. 30 millisecond attack, 2 to 1 ratio, 100 millisecond release. Never doing a ton, just kissing the needle. Up next, I have Ozone 9, doing a bevy of things, really. So first, I've got this EQ. I'm gonna reintroduce every part one at a time as I explain why I used what. So I have this EQ that I used basically during the process of gain matching until I got it so close that uh, I really didn't have to do much. So once it was at like 50%, once I realized there was literally only like one dB of variation between the parts, I'd generally gotten the profile right of the track that you wanted me to reference, so I got closer to the, the sonic profile, which means I can get rid of that match EQ. And all these choices that were made to cut some of that 150 hertz, to cut some of the 200 hertz, to cut just a little bit over 1K, to boost some of that 2K, to cut some more 4K, and to have a high shelf up here, to make up for the high end that we didn't have anymore from all the focusing. This brings up the overall air of the track, but this is like the most boost I'm doing and the most cut. This is like 3 dB right here. Everything else is basically 2 dB of cut or 1 dB of cut so that I'm not doing a ton of EQing. So that just brings it forward, makes it more aggressive sounding. Up next, I have an exciter, basically blending in less than 20% on pretty much everything except the, the high mids of just tape, tube, triode, all that kind of distortion, blending it in subtly with the mix to bring up the overall aggression of it. So that really brings everything forward a whole lot. So then when I matched it with the EQ after these two things that primarily affect the EQ, I got a curve that basically said you don't have to do pretty much anything else. So I kept that there just to show the reference, but I wouldn't be using the match EQ after that because my track basically sounds the way I want it to now. Then I have a little bit more dynamic control with each band, doing about one dB of gain reduction with very fast attacks and releases. Controlling that high mid and controlling the high end, but also bringing it up a little. That creates the more consistent high end that you like. Up next, I used another vintage tape machine because I couldn't help it. Just ever so much harmonic excitement in the top and the low and bringing up the overall harmonics in the middle. And then I used the limiters, never doing more than like one or two dB of limiting per limiter. To get the same kind of loudness that the other one got, I had to do a little bit. So that's doing like 2 dB of gain reduction. And this is doing like less than 1. So now I'm getting to the same RMS values that the impending doom track was at. All with staggered limiting so that when it gets time for the dynamic parts to happen, they're still dynamic. There's just like, you know, 4 or 5 dB of gain reduction on the whole track and you've got some 
overwhelmingly powerful stuff going on. So now that it's a lot stronger, you hear where the differences were all staggered. They were all made basically to be incremental changes that work to the benefit of the whole song. And without the mastering, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just a little bit less sculpted and a little bit less loud. And for the most part, that's all I'm doing when I'm in the uh, mastering phase is I'm just gently bringing up the overall In post, I'm actually going to gain match those so that you can hear that with the level the same, they're really not that much different, but the volume boosts kind of make it sound like they're more different. They're really not. And you'll hear that they're basically just a little bit crunchier because of that uh, distortion that was added, that exciter and that tape machine. And it's just a little bit more focused because some of the areas where there might have still been a little bit of fighting in the 100 hertz to 200 hertz or 300 hertz area, those areas were cut down a little bit to focus more in the way that you wanted from your reference. So for the most part, everything that was shown in the EQ when I matched it was actually affected on individual tracks like the kick, the bass, the guitars, etc. and the vocals. And then I did a little bit, no more than 2 to 3 dB of sculpting on the master track once I fixed the problems with the original mix. And really, this only took me about an hour to do overall. So it's not a tough thing to do. There's really not a ton of elements. One thing you should focus on when having your references is just making sure that your elements stack up the same way. So you notice that when I was mixing, I had the reference set to like negative eight and a half dB. That way, it was a lot closer in RMS to the values that I was getting on the track beforehand. So I was peaking around like negative 15, negative 16 dB RMS when I was mixing it. And so I brought down the reference to be that so that I wasn't being blinded by the loudness of the track. And from there, I was able to see that, oh, I need to bring up my guitars a little bit. Oh, I need to bring down the cymbals just a tiny bit. And I need to have a little bit more room because the roominess of like the kick and the snare and the toms was a little bit more in that track. So, you know, I did those things to compensate. I used the transient designers to effectively emulate the room on the snare and the toms. And I had added verbs and parallel compression. All that stuff is just supplementary to making sure that you get a track that translates across different mediums and different devices. Overall, I hope that helped. If you guys have any tracks that you want to send me, or if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments below. I really appreciate you watching, and I hope that this Mix Fix tutorial has opened your eyes to a couple of different things that can be done to make your mixes a little bit more powerful, a little bit more aggressive. And at the end of the day, it's all just about doing what sounds good to you. And if you like it, go for it. Thanks a ton. This has been Phil from One Wall Studio, and I hope to see you guys again next time. Bye-bye.